Okay, so I guess the stage is mine. I can't believe the doc gave a salesperson a moderator role here. So, uh, <laughs> and my friend Brett over there. So what's interesting about our panel is we actually have three practitioners and two vendors. So it's going to be really exciting to hear what the practitioners are seeing and how the vendors can complement that and say, oh yeah, we've gone through that a hundred times. So um, let's do some introductions. We'll start with Shao Kahn. And uh, Shao Kahn will be speaking English and Chinese. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, uh, good morning, or maybe I should say uh, very soon, good afternoon. Eh? Okay. So first of all, very nice to be here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, well, to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Xiao Kun Jiao. I'm currently the head of uh, uh, Active Quantitative and Multi-Strategy Investments with, with uh, this mutual fund company called the Pengyang Asset Management. And uh, I came back to China uh, three and a half years ago, and I uh, joined the industry back in 2000. Uh, I spent probably 15 years in New York. Um, the, uh, the, the longest time I spent with a company uh, is, well, was Lima Brothers. And of course, every time you know, when I mention the name Lima Brothers, I have to also, I have, I have to also to mention that it's the uh, Lima before penthouse. So okay, I, I don't want to get into the, you know, the, uh, the painful history of, of, of what happened. But you know, it was Lima Brothers, and you know, we joined the uh, became Uber Berman, which is uh, which was a, a mutual fund company. And before and after, you know, I spent time with different hedge funds, with uh, different investment banks, and all my career since 2000, I've been working on fund investments. Excellent. Yes, and thanks for this uh, opportunity. Uh, my name is Brett Turvey. I, I work for Dow Jones. Uh, we're a news corp uh, company. Uh, we publish the Wall Street Journal, Barings, Market Watch, uh, and, a, and a ton of other publications. Uh, we're an aggregate of news. Uh, many of you may have heard of Factiva and uh, over 30,000 news sources. So uh, we've been in this business for a while, and my background is in, in market data. I've been with the competitors of Theologic and Thomson Reuters and Infinitiv. Uh, so I've been doing this for several years now, based in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and we come from a perspective now where I look after the Asia Pacific uh, big data solutions side for Dow Jones, where we, we look at uh, feeding in our news sources that we have, our global Factiva collection, into more of alternative uh, AI, machine learning, text mining applications. So this is what we're, we're focused on now. Interesting. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Dan Lee, and uh, I'm leading the Harvest uh, uh, Data Lab. The Harvest Group is a leading uh, fundamental uh, driven uh, asset manager in China. Uh, but we are a relatively young uh, team within Harvest. We established last year and under the leadership of our chairman. Uh, so uh, our major purpose is to uh, digitalize the whole, uh, and industrialize and digitalize the whole uh, uh, research process to really empower the uh, buy side uh, research team to do better research uh, by giving them better data and also by uh, our efforts in knowledge graph. So from my personal experience, I worked two years with our uh, chairman as assistant, and then I started this uh, group of uh, new efforts with my uh, colleagues across uh, different uh, departments. So we brought a new team with uh, background in finance and IT, and together uh, we created this, uh, what we call it, data lab. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm from WeBank, I'm an AI scientist. Okay, uh, in WeBank we use alternative data uh, uh, to design the ESG framework and under this framework uh, we map the development of economy uh, of a company or area or, or something else. Uh, but um, some companies we uh, design some uh, framework to protect the user privacy. Uh, that's my hope. Want to be way back. Okay. And a short little uh, bio on me. I've been in fintech for 15 years, and I believe Jamie from CME actually took some of my thunder away. I was in the low latency game. I was an equity holder and uh, obviously employee of Perseus Telecom. And uh, that game, the commoditization of uh, latency, really is done now. It's too expensive to get in the game and go west with the consortium. So now, alternative data has been. Very exciting for, say, vendors and salespeople in the United States. So being able to represent GTCom and get that brand out in the United States has been absolutely amazing. A lot of people ask me, they're like, you 
know, how's the support dealing with teams from Beijing? And I'm like, it's absolutely amazing. We work 24-7 and we do everything as a team. There's no I. It's like strictly a team. And I, I just wanted to commend and then wish GTCom a uh, happy birthday for the sixth anniversary. So that's my little background. Um, so going to WeBank, um, how is it? So how do you map the factors to alternative data in your structure? Uh, okay, uh, in WeBank, uh, uh, we use a lot of lots of kinds of alternative data satellites, um, the satellite imagery uh, and uh, temporal spatial big data uh, and the sentimental data uh, and so on. Today I will give some uh, examples uh, that I use the alternative data to, to dig the uh, alpha uh, and, uh, and there's a ESD framework of how, we, uh, how do we um, map the economic development of some area. Okay. Um, today, if we want uh, to picture uh, the development of the sub, uh, the quantified uh, the economic development, what figure do we use? GDP, all right? And but GDP uh, is a scale figure. Uh, it may, may be used in the uh, nationwide um, and uh, citywide or provincewide. But if we really want to know the confined uh, the development of the economy in certain areas, uh, um, how do we how do we quantify it? In way back, we use satellite imagery analysis uh, to build a model to stress some features. Uh, such as uh, the roads, uh, the, the, the meters of the roads, and uh, the number of cars, um, uh, and the diversity of the ground surface, uh, uh, such, as, such as these features, we built a complex model uh, to quantify the index of the economy. Okay, let's uh, go to detail. Uh, mm, uh, in, uh, in the satellite imaginary scenario, it's very difficult to detect the target because the target in the picture uh, the, is very, very small and uh, we can't have no more, uh, no more the features uh, to, to, detect, to detect target. Uh, so, we so we optimize uh, our uh, convolutional network. Uh, uh, to detect to detect a small target, okay, uh, such as such as the uh, uh, we count the number of vehicles. Uh, based on the vehicles, we can calculate the, the act activity of the people uh, in the, in such area. Second, um, we extract the rules uh, from the satellite imagery uh, because if, if we want uh, uh, calculate the development of the economy. Uh, we usually, we usually uh, calculate the, uh, how long uh, the roads in this area. Uh, so uh, we, use, we also use optimize the convolutional network uh, to extract the roads network in this area. The third, uh, we classify the diversity of the ground surface uh, because, the, because the diversity of the grounds uh, Maps the maps maps uh, the the diversity of this economy in this area. Um, so we use these three features, uh, three uh, features to build a model to map the macro uh, economy in this area. Uh, another example, uh, we use spatial uh, and temporal big data to uh, to predict the area uh, of a company. Mm, for example. In 2006, uh, we predicted the revenue of uh, Apple uh, in the mainland. Mm. We use uh, uh, location data uh, as a basic as a basic data source to predict uh, the revenue of the uh, Apple in 2006. Mm. We count the number of the people to purchase and to run at the store of the uh, uh, Apple store. Uh, then we can, uh, pre we can predict the, the revenue compared with the last year, year-on-year uh, -year growth or year-on-year -year decline. decline uh, mm -hmm. As a result, based on this model, uh, we find that in 2006, um, the revenue declined by uh, 24. Um, and uh, compared with the 
uh, business report reviews by the Apple company, um, it was 33 percent. Okay, it's amazing. So, um, based on the uh, temple space of big data, uh, we can predict the revenue in advance um, and very, uh, ac very accurate, right? Um, the third example is that um, in the last in the last thirty uh, uh, thirty years in China, uh, what's the most important investment tool? Maybe real estate, right? Okay, um, so lots of money rush into this area, uh, and this area is overheated. Uh, so, uh, lots of the buildings are built uh, without the li without a uh, person living there. We call it in China, Guizhou, right? Okay, if we, if we buy the buildings in this area, um, no trade will exist, uh, and our money will be in dangerous, okay? Uh, so, how do we find this uh, uh, ghost city? Uh, it's a very important talk. It's a very important topic. In way back, and in my prior company, uh, by Du, uh, we found that a very useful tool. Uh, we use satellite imagery. Uh, first, we find the area uh, where the people living, uh, where the building building, where the where where are the buildings. Uh, it's the first step. Then. Uh, under this area of the building, we count the number of locations. Um, if if the number of locations lower, um, under threat, under uh, threat code, um, we call it uh, this area maybe a potential go city. Mm -hmm. Based on this method, we found more than thirty three uh, points maybe called it a go city. Uh, it's amazing. So um, if we buy buildings. Um, uh, we will not we will not choose this place uh, to to buy our house. All right. Uh, okay. That's the three examples. Uh, we uh, use alternative data to to find some uh, to find some the uh, alpha or to avoid some dangers. Okay. Thank you. So on the risk management front. All right. Um, Shokan, you actually had um, a lot of experience. So can you give us some of the realities? Um, being fintech vendor as we know, I run into a lot of vendors and I think that's one of the challenges now. It's a lot of confusion of uh, very small vendors and they might not be adequate to be in the business. So with your rich history, can you give some of the realities of alternative data and what you've seen over the last 15 years? Uh, sure. Uh, actually, uh, before I start, I, I, I do want to mention that, you know, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I came back to China a couple of years ago, and you know, really without an English English speaking environment, I uh, feel like my English is a little sluggish, as, as a matter of fact. So uh, I, I was telling Tom that you know, I'm going to kind of use a mixture of Chinese and English. Uh, I'll try to you know stay on the English side, but whenever I don't feel comfortable, I'll do the switch. So uh, whoever is doing the translation, uh, please uh, be prepared. <laughs> okay, feel so, free. Yeah. So the, you know. A couple of days ago, you know, when, when we were discussing uh, on, the, on the WeChat group exactly, you know, what, what do we want to talk about? And I do feel like this is probably a good time for me to kind of, uh, you know, there's a, I think there's a Chinese, there's a Chinese or Western as well, you know, you have a, when, 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 when there's a topic, right, when there are two sides, one uh, positive side or one negative side, you know, there's, you, you can, sometimes people say, you know, you play the, either a, a white face or, or a black face or red face or whatever. So I'll try to stay on the, on the gray face. <laughs> so that's what, that's what I plan to do. Anyway, so I'm going to be, you know, paint maybe just a slightly uh, negative picture uh, based, on, based on my very limited personal experience, you know, you know regarding the, the, the alternative uh, Anyway, so... This is the third panel here, and uh, you, you, we listened to the, uh, the first two panels. You know, we, uh, we heard a lot of keywords, like alternative data, or big data, you know, uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence, and, and so on and so forth. So, my, my, my first question is, you know, as an investor, you know, I want to share my experience, my thoughts, as well, purely from a coin invest, uh, investor side of the story. So why do we need data? Okay, I want to use the word alternative or baking. I don't want to put these two words in front of data. It's just data. Okay, it's just data. So why why do we need data? Okay, as a as a point investors, 
we want to use data. We want to play with data, as, as you know, I think people earlier already mentioned. We play with data, and we use data to construct factors. To construct factors. So in a quant investment world, you know, whether you are doing the quant equity side or you are doing the managed future side, 99% of the time, you have a multi-factor framework. Okay. So we need data in order to construct new factors. That is truly, we want to have truly orthogonal factors that can really truly bring uncorrelated returns with respect to the current factors. That is the whole purpose. Okay. So having said that, I want to take a step back and you know I want to use a quant equity as an example. And I want to take a step back and I want to go back to history and really look at how the quant investment or the quant equity investment has evolved in the last in the, in the past couple of decades. Okay. And use that as a starting point. So now first of all, I think everything started probably probably in the 60s, if I remember correctly. Okay. It was the uh, the MSCI, the Bara people, you know, you have the virus model, you know. This word, I'm not sure whether it was invented at the time, but it was a factor. Then gradually, from the 60s until to the 70s, until, uh, you know, until now, the framework of multi, the multi-factor framework has been, you know, has been kind of mature and more, become more mature and so on. But if you look at the past a couple of decades, okay, each step along the history, I think it was the 70s when the BGI, when the BGI people, they, they invented the first index fund, then the first actively quant managed fund. Then in the early 90s, it was, uh, I think, well, 1992 or 1993, you know, I'm sure they're, 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 they're experts, quant, quant, quant investor experts in the audience, right? So you know what I'm talking about. So in the 1992 or 1993, you have uh, the very famous Fala French three factor model. Then, you know, you have the uh, the Jagadish Pittman, you know, the, uh, the AQR people, someone mentioned AQR people, you know, momentum effects and so on and so forth. If you can really go back to history, think about this. If you can really go back to history, you go back to 1992, early 90s, what are the alternative data at the time? Probably all the financial ratios, all the, all the accounting data, all the EPs, all the BPs, all the dividend yields, those are the alternative data at the time, right? Then you, 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 you wait for another couple of years, you know, you have the a kind of a crew concept, you know, you have the momentum concept. At that time, those are the alternative data. Okay. So I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, alternative data is not something new, it's not something special. It's not because, you know, we just put the word alternative in front of the data to make it very special, to make it very sound fancy. It's, it's not the case. Because in the last couple of decades, you know, the quant people have been doing that already. So it's not something new. So that's the first point I'm trying to make. And the second point I'm trying to make, which is, uh, is unfortunately is, is a bit more negative, is that based on my own experience, that I remember uh, more than 10 years ago, you know, when, when we were still even, you know, because all the factors, quality factors, kind of already well known. Right? A lot of people were, were doing that, you know, government people, AQR people, you know, including uh, when I was starting Lehman, all the big buy side firms. A lot of people already kind of make the factors well known. So when everyone has the same set of factors, what's going to happen? You're going to have a very quality effect, right? And, uh, you know, for, 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 again, for the experienced coin investors, you know what happened in August 2007? It was a coin belt, right? It was a coin belt. So more and more people start to look at new alternative, new alternative data, try to diversify away from the existing factors, okay? So at the time, I remember, you know, we, I start to look into uh, like, uh, flow data, for example. I start to look into uh, measure the sentiment, for example. Um, you know, we did a lot of uh, try to do a lot of pattern recognition stuff. I try to find find, find the market news, the sentiment, and try to see whether any of the information is useful to predict equity returns. Now, the results at the time was kind of a uh, spot. It was on and off. You know, sometimes you do see some information, sometimes you don't. Okay. So it was exactly at the time I started to kind of kind of question whether we are still able to find truly alternative data to find the true information to bring, you know, truly uncorrelated alpha to the existing framework. Okay. And, you know, it's, uh, it was uh, 2007, 2008, now it's, now it's 2019, right? 10, 11, 12 years already passed. And I, more and more I start to question, I start to question whether we are able to find the truly alternative data. Because, you know, I, I do want to mention one thing is that 
when we think about data, think about new factors, when we think about the uh, uh, you know AI and so on and so forth, I haven't heard I haven't heard one hedge fund product or one investment strategy that uses truly orthogonal data and truly successful SD. I haven't heard one. You know, when I discussed this topic, when I raised the question to uh, to my uh, friends in the industry, there are very reputable hedge funds, you know, or, or mutual fund companies. We can't share the same view. We can't share the same view. So, you know, I, I don't want to be too negative. I'm sure the answer is out there. You know, maybe because you know I'm, I'm not doing enough research yet. You know, uh, I raised the questions, and also myself is moving, searching for the answers. But uh, just more and more, I start to <laughs> I start to have, have, have doubts. And also on the, uh, the AI artificial intelligence side, it's kind of a similar story. It's a very similar story. I mean, I. 99% of the time, if you do have foreign investments, okay, let's put aside the, uh, the high frequency trading first because that's a totally different angle. But if you do have tra doing, uh, you know, traditional coin equity, you know, you have a lot of uh, complemental, the so-called complemental factors, right? And if you are doing kind of a higher frequency, you know, like, like the statistical value transfer guys, they have a lot of uh, technical factors, a lot of more divergence and stuff. So, again, I, I just haven't seen any truly new alternative data that can really bring true alpha. And uh, finally, let me just uh, you know, end my conversation with with uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with Andrea. <coughs> and I read this. It was end of last year. It was an interview from a, a meeting or an interview from David Harding. And I'm sure you know a lot of you know who David Harding is, right? Here. The, Founder and chairman of uh, Winton Capital is probably one of the, not one of them, but it's probably the largest CTA or managed future investors out there. So uh, the uh, the conversation here is actually in Chinese. So I'm, I'm going to read in Chinese first, and uh, I'll try to translate. Okay. So this is what he said. Investment. Well, let, let me read in Chinese first. Okay. 投资是社会科学，而不是自然科学。目前这种形式的人工智能。很难在投资领域取得非常突破性的成就。Okay, I'll, I'll say this in Chinese. Okay, so investment is a social science. It's not a, a natural science. So right now, you know, the, the, the type of uh, the kind of uh, artificial intelligence we, uh, you know, we have right now, it's very very difficult to have a breakthrough in the investment world. That's what that's what he said, and I think I agree with that. It's interesting. I think a lot of the investment strategies go around regulation. So we brought up HFT, Reg NMS was big with that, and now with um, data, it has to do a lot with MIFID two and separation of research. I believe the JP Morgan fellow was talking about that as well. So that's you're going to see in the financial media world, they're going to start highlighting that type of regulation and then products around it. So, um, but you segue perfectly into what Brett sees because Brett, I believe, being a Dow Jones and having a lot of um, experience in the industry. You, part of your job as a strategic advisor, really helping integrate and seeing the common problems of all the buy sides out there and other types of funds you're dealing with. So, if you want to highlight any of that, yeah. So, I come from a bit more of an optimistic viewpoint on, on data, <laughs> um, but yeah, there are, there are some issues, and and it's it's obvious that everybody is excited about big data and, and wanting to implement it into their into their firms. Um, but there's this really a quote. Or it's actually a, a snippet from a MIT article that some of you might have read or, 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 or seen, where 73 percent of firms believe that uh, AI can help their business. 23 percent have adopted it, but only five percent are actually actively uh, using it properly. Uh, and that really resonates when we when we talk to clients, because um, there really there really is an issue with um, I'll go into a client or we'll go into a client. And they'll come up to us and say, "Hey, Brett, what is it that you guys can do for us around AI and, and news, and, and, and how are you going to help our business?" And it's a red flag for for me when I'm in the meeting because obviously I can tell right from the beginning that they probably lack the resources, they probably lack uh, you know the need for for what it is that they're actually trying to achieve, or they don't even know what they're trying to achieve. Um, so the most important thing I, I I I talk to them about is you know what are your resources. Do you have stakeholders and sponsors that are involved in this decision? Do you have a defined use case? Is there an actual hypothesis that you that you have and you want to define and, and, and solve? Um, do you have data scientists? Do you have data engineers? Uh, do you have a budget? So there's a lot of different things that 
uh, a lot of these organizations, organizations want to actually play in that market, but they don't have the tools to actually do it. So what my job is to do is to is to bring in because we're we're simply a, a data company. We're, we're data as a service. We don't provide anything other than the raw data in the form that they want to to bring it in in, in, in machine learning applications. Um, so we bring in. We, the, our first thing is, do you have the resources? If you don't, hire a consultant. And, and, and you know, there's a plug for any consultants out there, but. Um, consultants have been through most of these, and whether that's a small consultant, a medium consultant, or a big four, where they've gone through the process. They've gone through it many times with small, medium, and large sized companies. Uh, they've gone through from the beginning to the end. They know what some of the mistakes are, they know what the wins are, they know how to define a use case and, 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 and allocate resources appropriately. So I think that's the number one uh, take is making sure you have an actual hypothesis, and making sure you have a defined use case before you actually get uh, into this type of uh, type of alternative data or, or investment. Because um, it is kind of like I use I like using analogies, but it is like if you if you're if you're super hungry and you're going into the grocery store to buy something for for, for dinner, but you don't know what you actually want to make, you you end up making bad decisions because you just start grabbing stuff. And you don't know what you're grabbing, and then you spend too much money, and whatever. It's, it's kind of the same thing with data. A lot of people don't really even understand what data they actually have in their organization as well. So the second thing would be doing a proper uh, data audit. You know, what what are you already paying for? You know, if you you already have feeds from multiple sources. Do you have uh, financial feeds, data feeds? Because a, a majority of firms aren't actually utilizing the data that they are already out of pocket for. So understanding what that what you actually have is an, is an important thing to, to know. And, and this is this is we see this with large big companies as well. Almost almost more so because they're so big they have they don't have a lot of cross cross team collaboration. Uh, so that's the, the the second point. And the third point would be more around uh, and a consultant would help with this and you know we introduce people to those as well but is is, to, is going through a, a proper proof of concept or POC where and and not being quick about it because this is not something these are long term strategies so three month or six month or even a year long proof of concept where you you look at the da data integrity um, you know the old saying garbage in garbage out that really applies to this type of ap application where if you really don't have quality data that's coming into the organization you know do you really expect to get quality results at the end? Probably not. Um, looking at, is the, is the right licensing and copyright uh, you know, framework in place? Because we've seen a lot of instances where, oh no, we're already doing this, we're scraping this from the web, and, and we're getting this from this source, but you know, a lot of firms don't actually recognize you actually need licensing and copyright requirements to actually text mine on this, on this data. So making sure that stuff is in place, and again, this this goes back to consultants and or hiring in-house people that are going to be able to, to help the organization uh, go through with that. Um, and then finally, on, on the proof of concept side, is from the beginning to the end, making sure that the stakeholders and the sponsors are involved from the beginning all the way to the end. Because so many times we've seen where. It's the stakeholder or the person that's trying to do something with the data that starts the conversation but doesn't bring in the business side and the data scientist side at the, at the beginning. So then you end up going through the cycle of you start down the road, go back to the beginning, explain it again to the business side, keep going down, and then bring in the data scientists and so forth. So you do a lot of this back and forth, wasting a lot of time, wasting a lot of money, when if you just get them involved from the beginning, it would make everyone's job uh, much easier, and, and there's, there's the business side does not know how to deal with the data, and the data side does not know how to actually work with the business. So it's it's impossible not having them from the beginning, and it's really really common that you know this this usually starts from somewhere down in the middle middle office. They want to kind of get the framework in place before they bring it up to the boss. But in my experience, it's been better to have just take it to the boss right away, get them on board. And then it's a much smoother process. Um, but yeah, and then the last part about it is a, is is implementing in the proof of concept key 
points where you get feedback from the organization. So there's going to be somebody that's going to measure what is success in the proof of concept along the way. And you need to have the mechanisms in place to actually measure that. Otherwise, you get to the end of the proof of concept and you don't even know what you achieved. Uh, so defining that at the beginning, understanding what that is, and putting mechanisms in place. So we've had organizations where there's actually, so it's an application base where the, the test audience who, who, are, who, are, who are using the application will get a pop-up box every single time that they get something and it simply says, was this useful, was this not, or provide a comment. So then they collect that data, again we're using data to analyze data, and at the end, you know, there's something, a, a metric they can measure with. And, and you know, those are my, my, uh, my points that I've pointed out from conversations we've had over from this organization and, and, and the other ones I've worked for, which I think would be successful in trying to make sure that you implement something properly. Oh, the common salespersons, they, their job is herding cats, and it seems like you have a system to herd the cats around the infrastructure, oh, sorry, the uh, organizational level. So, um, kind of over you, Dan. Um, Brett brought up uh, financial audit, um, auditing the data that's already there, and as you are deputy at the data lab, you're creating it from the ground up, correct? Can you give us some of the experiences of, um, you know, starting from the ground up? So, uh, before we uh, talk about the data uh, problem, I think we probably need to jump out and look at the environment. The environment in China is pretty different from the US. First of all, we are retail market, that means sentiment plays a big role. Second of all, we are policy market, that means it's very important to study policy, study politics. Um, and third of, uh, and third of all, um, China is a non-efficient market. China is a relatively non-efficient market compared to the US. That's why you will see a lot of quantitative methodologies not working. A lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, classic uh, uh, rules, classic formulas to learn from your class not apply to China. So because the environment is different, so approach should be different. The battlefield we choose should be different. Uh, so in China nowadays, still, I think 90% uh, or 95% of the uh, asset managers are, uh, are fundamental investors. It's a hard sell, relatively speaking, a hard sell to, uh, to uh, fundamental investors when you, you know, uh, introduce them, you promoting your quantum data because their thinking process is relatively long. Their decision making process is unstable. Uh, there are a lot of factors that uh, will count in their final decision making. Uh, but if, is your data really helpful to them? It's very hard to say because if you're doing a uh, quantitative method, you can do you know, back testing. But, but uh, for fundamentals, it's, it's a different story. And they are more long term thinking people. So, uh, so our approach is uh, we take a step back. We think. Uh, Solving a, a single problem using a single data is not that valuable to a firm like uh, uh, Harvest. Uh, what is more valuable to us is to build up the fundamental, build up the uh, infrastructure for the whole investment team to really can uh, for for them to really uh, benefit from from data, benefit from technologies. So uh, we think there are four important components. Uh, in the whole research process. Data, logic, knowledge graph, and model. So first of all, we are solving the first two problems, data and knowledge graph. Uh, the reason why we do this is, uh, first of all, we want to uh, centralize the data. Uh, centralize the data from Bloomberg, from Wind, from you know, all the uh, industrial data. And also, we centralize the data you, you know, in China, a lot of data are uh, are going through the sales side, from sales side to buy side, and the sales side's data format are really different from ours. And everyone they have different format, and everyone has different applications. So what we are doing is that we're trying to uniform everyone's format, so to put in our system, so our research analysts can pull the data anywhere they they want across different forms, 
uh, using Azel, using our online platform, uh, using uh, you know Slide uh, uh, point points. Uh, we build those plugins into those uh, different uh, systems, and then also we do uh, knowledge graph. Knowledge graph, I think, is the fundamental of all the future artificial intelligence uh, because uh, it's related to data mapping. So now data is is stored in different format, but we think in the future data should be stored in a graph format. So the data is, has a very clear linkage to people, to entities, to companies. And that kind of uh, uh, fundamental layer is very important because if you have a very nice data, very clear and very uh, 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 nice database about the shareholders structures, their product lines, you know, their downstreams and upstream uh, uh, companies. Uh, you know, if you have all those information and plus the uh, location-based data, help you to mapping each companies. If they are manufacturing companies, what are their sites? What are their locations? How they operate? Uh, if there are a uh, real estate companies, what's the stage of each site? Can you really uh, monitor the, the current stage of each uh, buildings that are being built? So that's, is, that is a bottom line, the, the, the very fundamental things if you want to do artificial intelligence or data research in, in the future. So now, uh, I mean, at the current stage, we are building up these two layers. Uh, but in the future, we are going to uh, uh, wrap it into uh, what we call the Shuli Zhong Kai, which is very famous in, in China now, popular in China, is a kind of a buzzword, uh, uh, data uh, middle deck, middle deck. So uh, all the data coming through different vendors, and we do data map mappings to solve different problems in different scenarios. So that is what we think will uh, have a very big impact, I think, in the, in, in, in the future of uh, uh, human uh, machine interactions when you do, do investment. So basically, we think uh, investment will, and also research, will change from a human centered, uh, small, simple sized, deductive approach to a machine and human combined. Uh, uh, approach based on logic, based on big data. That's great. I have a quick question for everybody on the panel. There's a book by Kafu Lee called um, AI Superpowers, so it's talking about US and China being the dominant players in these buzzwords, AI and big data. Do you, um, do you think there's room for any other people? In, like, do you think somewhere in Europe could come up and come up with really good AI, or do you think US and China are the two dominant ones? Really far ahead, and it's just you know a yes or no, or just a little color. You can speak Sao Chou Kan. I think it's a, it's it's very difficult for me to. Uh, why not? Of course, why not? I mean, we're, we're all human beings, right? I mean, it doesn't matter whether you are in America, or you are you are you are in uh, China, you are in Europe. As long as there is a proper uh, what do you call it, uh, the environment, you know, and the research, everything is not stop. It's, ne it's, it's never ending. So, who knows, maybe just tomorrow, maybe it's tonight, someone will come up with a new idea. Right? That's my view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's an absolute naive approach to think that America and China are going to be the only ones to come up with great AI. Um, I see it, I cover Asia Pacific, I travel around from India to Australia to Japan, and there's some really, really interesting stuff happening in Japan, especially um, in India. I mean, they have the man, they have the, 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 the labor as a technology team in there to start developing stuff as well. So, I mean, I can talk from an Asia Pac perspective, um, but yeah, China is definitely a powerhouse, but Japan's right there, India's right behind them, um, and then, you know, I think that's where it starts in, in this region for sure. But yeah, it's great insight. I think it's, uh, it's hard to say, but uh, uh, at current stage, I still think the U.S. leading uh, asset management firms has a, a, 
a leading edge over, over, over uh, other peers. Uh, for example, I think uh, Bridgewater uh, is uh, really building up a, uh, a system, a mirror system, uh, powered by data, powered by iLogic, that mimics the day-to-day, uh, the day-to-day uh, uh, day -day, uh, change of the capital and also the uh, economic world. So I think that kind of system takes time to build up. It's not like what we call you know, AI investment. It's more like uh, human-machine interactions. And it's more like uh, to uh, write down your thoughts and make your thoughts readable to machines and uh, really make it a stable, a very sound system. It takes years to build up this kind of system. I don't think you know, any uh, players can catch up in a very short uh, short, short term. So, uh, but but uh, in Harvest, we are trying to to do this kind of things. We are trying to make every analyst to write down their analytical framework, how they uh, analyze companies, how they analyze sectors, how they analyze economies, and we ask them to draw down those knowledge graph. And uh, and then the next step for us is quite challenging: is how to standardize it, how to make it machine readable how to make it calculate, uh, able to calculate. So that's, that's pretty challenging, so, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we, can, uh, we can have some achievement in the future. Okay, well, I don't want to compare any nations, uh, um, but I want to express um, uh, who, uh, who will, um, who will uh, uh, grab the opportunity of the alternative data who will be winner in the next day. Okay, but um, the, the first step is to uh, to solve the problem of data privacy or data privacy. Uh, if we don't uh, care, we don't um, get enough 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 data, uh, we cannot get a, a better performance of the model. So, um, the, first, the first step is to, uh, to solve the uh, uh, data privacy or user privacy problem. Uh, we we design some uh, such as a federal data learning uh, to solve this user privacy problem. Under um, um, this framework, uh, the models can uh, the models can be trained on uh, part of the data and cannot be uh, exchanged exchanged the data between uh, between this part uh, from the that part uh, to this part. Okay, uh, they only change the change the parameters from this part to that part. Um, so we cannot always have the opportunity to steal the data from this part or from that part. Okay, it's safe, it's safe, it's totally safe. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have this technology, uh, we can achieve uh, the real value of alternative data. Uh, that's my opinion. Okay. Thanks everybody for the insight. A book came out maybe 12 years ago by Thomas Friedman called The World is Flat, and I remember reading it when it was new. And now that I'm you know, 15 years into my career, I truly feel like the world is flat now that I've worked for a Beijing-based company. And I just think it's amazing that what we're seeing in this day and age, and it's only gonna make, I think, life's for, life for everybody better, globally. And it's just been really exciting for me, so. We're pretty short on time, so unless anyone has a question in the audience, uh, we can conclude. All right, let's give everyone a round of applause. This is great.